Okay, I think I'll go ahead and get started. Chris, is that, are we ready to go? Yes, ma'am. All right, great. Well, I'd like to welcome everyone to our Evenings with Genetics seminar series for tonight. My name is Pilar Magulis. I'm a genetic counselor at Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's Hospital. And I'm thrilled to introduce our speakers for today. So the topic of the presentation today is does genetics influence behavior? And we have two speakers. Our first is gonna be Dr. Daryl Scott. Dr. Scott received his undergraduate training at Brigham Young University. After graduation, he was accepted to the medical science training program at the University of Iowa, where he completed his MD training and also graduated with a PhD in genetics. He then moved to University of Utah, where he did a residency in pediatrics, and then to Baylor College of Medicine, where he did a second residency in clinical genetics, and he's currently board certified in both specialties. After completing his residency training, Dr. Scott joined the Department of Molecular and Human Genetics at Baylor College of Medicine, where he's currently a professor with tenure. He runs a research laboratory dedicated to identifying the genetic causes of common birth defects, with specific emphasis on congenital diaphragmatic hernia and congenital heart defects. As a clinical geneticist, he cares for children with a variety of genetic disorders and collaborates with physicians and scientists from around the world to identify novel disease genes. He is also actively engaged in the training of medical students, residents, fellows, and masters and PhD graduate students. He and his wife, April, have seven children ranging in ages from 30 to 10 years old, and he enjoys camping, hiking, long distance running, cycling, and swimming. Our second speaker for today is Miss Cecilia Poole. Miss Poole has a daughter, Sarah Poole, who's 20 years old and she has Smith McGinnis syndrome. Their family lives in Bryan, Texas, but previously lived in Houston. And they've previously spoken to the Baylor College of Medicine medical students when they did live in Houston. Miss Poole and her husband, Dale Poole, host annual, annual picnics in Houston for families who have children with Smith McGinnis syndrome. And so with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Scott first to, for his presentation. And then we will save questions till the end. And if you could please use the Q&A function um, to enter your questions. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us tonight. So it's a pleasure to be here with you and to talk about something that's kind of a different thing for me. So I don't usually talk about the genetics of, of behavior, um, but it was an interesting challenge that someone asked me. They said, can you, can you talk on this particular topic? This was a few years ago. And I said, I'll have to learn a lot. But I imagine that we can find some important things out about behavior because so many things seem to be genetic. And so that's kind of where I'm going to start tonight. I'm actually going to start with something that probably most of us are, are well, at least more willing to believe, and that is that perhaps height might be genetic. So let's just talk about how we determine whether height is genetic, and then we'll see if we can apply that later on to how we think about behavior. So is height genetic? One of the things we can do to look at height as genetic is actually take a look at dogs. Now, dogs are all one species, and yet there's a great number of different dogs, of course, and everyone's going to agree that, yes, they come in different sizes, right? Even though they're all the same species. That means that there's different genes in each one of these dogs that makes them either smaller or taller. And so at least in this particular case, you'd say, yes, dogs would, would show that height is definitely at least in part genetic. And you can even see extremes in the dog's heights where you have really, really small, small dogs and really large dogs at the, at the extreme ends. If you look at mice, um, mice don't really aren't very tall, uh, but certainly mice can have different sizes. And so you have larger mice or smaller mice. Again, all one species can still have differences in their, at least their length. As far as humans go, well, this is just a Hollywood chart that was that I found on the internet. It shows some of the Hollywood stars and their heights. As you can see, it ranges anything from down to 410 to like 68. And so there's a great difference, of course, just in the heights of individuals, um, which again, since we're all the same species, we have to assume that part of that at least is genetic. Um, in humans, we can also see variances in, in like extremes, so extremely small individuals and extremely large or tall individuals. Um, but I also recognize that, that there are differences in different areas of the world. So on a regular basis, I go down with my family and we go to Guatemala. 
uh, this is not a picture of my family, but this is typically what we run into. When I go to Guatemala, my wife who's five foot four towers over most of the individuals there. And I'm six foot tall. So I'm at least a foot taller, it seems like, than almost anybody else that I see in clinic. And constantly when I work with a, with a geneticist in clinic, I'm asking, is that child's height normal? And after uh, rolling his eyes at me over and over again and, and, and ensuring me that this child was normal, I finally realized that, hey, we're just very different. Our height norms are very different for the United States and for children in Guatemala. And indeed, uh, over the course of time, I've had many children who've been sent to me for short stature. And one of the first things I ask when I enter the room is, do you happen to be from Guatemala? If the answer is yes, I tell them that probably everything is going to be just fine. One of the other things that's interesting about height is that you can actually predict height. So if you know a mom's height and a dad's height, you can actually predict what a child's height will be. And this is the equation for doing that. You record mother's and father's heights, you average it, and then you either go up two inches, two and a half inches if you're a boy, or subtract two and a half inches for a girl. Now, as you imagine, you may have brothers and sisters that have variations in height. And of course, this is only an approximation, but it gives you kind of a starting value. Then usually we think about being about two inches above or two inches below that line would be kind of like the typical variance. There's again exceptions. Um, but this actually, this rule actually works quite well. Now, there's there's some things that are definitely not genetic as far as height goes. Um, this is a, a basketball team from Bolivia. When I was a young man, I served as a missionary in Bolivia, and one of the things that we were asked if we could do was to go and play basketball with the local teams. We were Americans, and we were relatively tall, and so they were very excited to have us join join their teams. And so we, we had a team of a basketball team that we played in a small town called Valle Grande. And we were pitted against many local teams whose heights varied, usually less than us, but, but were reasonably tall individuals. What we thought was very interesting though, is after the games, their mothers and fathers would come out and greet their sons who were players. And we were shocked to see that their parents were often four, five, six, seven inches shorter than they were. When we asked about this, we were told that, well, my, all my siblings are taller, but all of my, my aunts and uncles who live in the campo, who live in the rural areas, they're much shorter than we are. And so it appeared that what happened was when these families moved to the city and were therefore able to get better nutrition, um, there was a difference in the height of their children, and it was a significant difference. And so height is not all genetic. There can be environmental factors that are important too. There's also genetic disorders that can make one very, very tall or very small. One of the things we think about is unusually tall individuals in their family can, in a family can sometimes have a syndrome called Marfan syndrome that's caused by a change in the FBN1 gene. These individuals do tend to have very tall stature and usually much taller than their unaffected siblings. At the same time, you may know individuals who have achondroplasia. This is caused by a change in the FGFR3 gene. Um, this is relatively common, but again, because of that change, these individuals would be much shorter. So the question then becomes, is height genetic? And the answer is partially partially genetic in that genes and the environment seem to be making a difference. And somewhere there's a, a combination of those two that ultimately determine how tall you are. Uh, you can't change your genes. You can change your, your environment so, at some point. But again, there's probably some maximum height at which you could possibly, possibly attain, even with the best nutrition. So let's ask another quick question. Is weight genetic? We're going to use the exact same things to, to determine if this is true. Um, first of all, we think about dogs. Different breeds of dogs actually can be considered quite thin or quite chubby. And again, this is the same, same species, but very, difference, very great differences in the breed or the genetics of these two different dogs. Um, we can think about uh, the fact that not all of the weight is genetic in that you can take a chihuahua and make it quite chubby by overfeeding it. And so again, weight is potentially 
partially genetic, but probably has an, an important nutritional component as well. Mice also show differences in their weight. These are mice on two different backgrounds, one white, one black, that have a change in a, in a specific gene that makes them extremely heavy. They don't burn as much energy and they have less, less mobility or they don't move or, and move around as much. And so they become quite obese, even though they're, they're sitting in the same cage as their non-obese um, litter mates. Um, this, these particular mice have a, have a change in, these, in the LEP gene. And again, they have this increased food intake and decreased energy, energy, energy expenditure, all caused by the, the changes in the LEP gene. So what about humans? <clears throat> Sometimes we want, don't want to talk about weight in humans, but uh, we do know that weight can vary. Um, and it's interesting if you say, well, how, how genetic is weight? One of the ways to do this is to actually do twin studies where we look at the differences or the similarities between identical twins and then individuals who perhaps are not identical twins but are non-identical or fraternal twins. We also can look at families to see how that happens. We can look at adoption studies where individuals are adopted out into a different environment. And overall, in looking at these studies, we typically think that body mass index, which is kind of like a determination of weight, is 50% to perhaps greater than 90% heritable. So in other words, do your genes make a difference in your weight? Yes, they do. Now there's also environmental things that make a difference too. Um, some things may be quite common. And so they may be something that all of us experience, like just the common things that we do in our environment along with all of our neighbors or they could be unique to a specific individual. Those can also be common to a family, or again, common to an individual in a family, or unique to an individual in a family. For example, um, I like to do triathlons, and I would suggest that I'm one of the thinner members of my family, and that's probably because I have a unique desire to run and bike and swim. This is the things that I do, and because of that, I burn a lot of calories. And that would be an environmental or a unique environmental change or difference that's, that's different between me and potentially my siblings. Other people don't have interest in triathlons. Instead, they may have interest in something else that we do in Texas, which is barbecue. Depending on how much you love barbecue and how much you eat barbecue, this could again be a unique environmental difference in you that of course makes a difference in your weight. So, Let's talk about this. What about genetic disorders? Remember how I talked about those mice that have the obesity? Well, that same thing can also happen in humans. So that very same change or those very same changes in that gene can make a difference in humans. In this case, this is a three-year-old who weighs 88 pounds. Um, but if you treat them or treat him with leptin, it makes a very big difference because that's the gene product that's not being made by his body correctly. And here's that same child at six years, weighing at 64 pounds, having been on leptin treatment. Again, a genetic disorder that is, that is in humans that makes a difference in weight. So was, was weight genetic? Uh, again, we would say partially. It's partially dependent on genes, on your environment, but also on personal choices. And by making these changes or, or these combinations, ultimately we determine or our weight is determined. But again, there are definitely genetic factors that are part of weight. So now we get to the topic at hand. Is behavior genetic? Before we conquer this topic, let's think about this a little bit. First, let's ask what exactly were we talking about when we talk about behavior? So behavior is defined as the way in which one acts or conducts oneself, especially towards others. Also can be defined as the way in which an animal or person acts in response to a particular situation or stimulus. And it's also the range of actions and mannerisms of an individual or organism. Each one of those is a slightly different um, definition, but probably genetics involves or is involved in all of those, as we will see next. So first, let's go back to dogs. Um, as it turns out, I work at Texas Children's Hospital, and in Texas Children's Hospital, we have therapy dogs. All of the therapy dogs that we have are golden retrievers. Uh, some of us are really good, and they can tell the difference between one therapy dog and the other. 
All I know is that they're all golden retrievers. And there's a reason why we pick golden retrievers to be therapy dogs, because they're pretty laid back, they're pretty happy, and they really don't cause a lot of problems. As you might imagine, if a different breed was chosen to be a therapy dog, we could have quite a different experience in our hospital. So for example, what if instead of golden retrievers, we had chosen to, to choose Rottweilers as our therapy dogs? Or how about pit bulls as our therapy dogs? You could say, well, that would be crazy. Like who in the world would put a Rottweiler or a pit bull into a, a therapy dog session? Like these are very intimidating dogs. But if they're all of the same species, that suggests that their behavior and their mannerisms are different because of genetics. And so in this particular case, yes. Do golden retrievers behave, behave the same as Rottweilers or pit bulls? Uh, in part, this could be because of their environment, how these dogs were trained, but generally there is a difference between the behavior of these dogs. Um, another test of this is kind of a fun test that was done oh, probably a few decades ago. Scientists realized that Border Collies and Newfoundlands are two different breeds of dogs that behave very differently. A Border Collie has actually been specifically raised or specifically bred to herd sheep. Newfoundlands are not, but these, these Border Collies have certain characteristics that are great for herding sheep. They have this extremely intimidating stare that they do. They love to fetch balls, but they absolutely detest swimming. They don't want to do anything with water. But again, they are great sheep herder dogs. Newfoundlands, on the other hand, are, were, were bred for water rescues. Uh, as it turns out, they don't stare. Like, they just don't. They're not particularly interested in anything in, in particular, and they don't tend to stare. They also have a very low interest in playing fetch. They do not fetch balls at all, but they love to swim. So what happens when we start to cross border collies in Newfoundlands? As it turns out, you can get a border collie that has Newfoundland type behavioral characteristics, or you can get a Newfoundland who loves to fetch balls. This is happening because again, there's differences in the genetics of their behavior. And by studying this, scientists actually have started to look for what are the genes that are involved in the behavior of these dogs. Let's go on to mice. Um, so one of the questions is, how do you determine behavior, say for a mouse? As it turns out, there are standardized behavior tests for mice. And so yes, mice do take tests on a regular basis in laboratories. What are these kind of tests? Well, basically what these tests are doing is we take modified, genetically modified mice, and we take control mice or wild type mice, and then we put them in these tests and we see if there's differences in the way that they behave. So for example, there's a specific test for anxiety. We can make a modified mouse and say, does this gene make a difference in this mouse's anxiety? So how do you measure that? One of the ways we measure that is a special, a special table, um, which is shown here. Um, this table is called an elevated plus maze. So the plus sign is the maze, but there's, there's differences. On one side, the arms are open, so the mouse realizes that if it goes to one side or the other, it will fall off. The other ones are closed. So the mouse can spend time in there and knows that no matter where it moves, it has the security of being in these closed areas. Now, mice also like to explore. And so one of the ways you can tell anxiety is the, the amount of time that a mouse spends in the closed arms versus the open arms. If it has high anxiety, it will want to be in the closed arms more and will not want to explore versus low anxiety mice. <laughs> if they have extremely low anxiety, they don't care what side of the maze they're on. And so you can see differences both in high anxiety and also differences in low anxiety. There's also this thing called social dominance. This is a really simple test. Uh, mice like to run through tubes. And so one of the things you can do is you can take a tube and you put a mouse on each side. The mice are introduced into the tube, they meet each other halfway through, and there's a winner or a loser. Basically, who's going to be dominant and say, I'm gonna to get to the other side of the tube and who's gonna to have to crawl backwards? And so this is a social dominance test. 
again, you can make a or can tell the difference between, let's say, a control and a transgenic, which is a mouse that's had a gene that's been mutated. And they may be different in their level of social dominance or their, their level of being a winner versus a loser in the test tube dominance test. There's also checks for social ability. Uh, again, these are kind of funny things that people have had to think about, but they do work. In this particular case, you have a mouse that's been isolated for a while and you introduce him to various different objects. So yeah, first thing that happens is, is you have a mouse that's given an empty cup on one side, or they can inter interact with an, a mouse that's hidden under a cup. Now the cup actually you can see on both sides so it can tell that the other mouse is there. Depending on how much time the mouse spends with the empty cup <laughs> versus the mouse that is under the cup determines sociability. Uh, as you can imagine, if someone's just as excited about an empty cup <laughs> as, as the mouse underneath it, they're not very social. And if they actually want to spend more time with the empty cup, uh, that's probably pathogenic. But anyway, most normal mice will not want to spend so much time with an empty cup. They want to spend time with a stranger. There's also a thing called social novelty. This is something, again, that mice demonstrate, which is they will spend more time with the mouse under the cup. But if you put a new mouse under the other cup, well, now that the mouse has gotten to know the first mouse, it will be more interested in learning about that second mouse. And so we actually see the difference between stranger one and stranger two, the more novel mouse. Most normal mice will actually spend time with the new stranger, the new mouse, because they have not gotten to know them yet. That's called social novelty. Again, many different ways that we can test the difference between a wild type mouse and a mouse that's had a gene that's been changed. So what about humans? Well, we think about some things that are some characteristics of humans. For example, you might say, well, I would say that my child is shy, or maybe you say that you are shy. That's a behavior. Uh, that would be the opposite of, let's say, outgoing. And again, you can look at children in a room and say, that one's shy, that one's very outgoing. And maybe you see this even amongst your own children or amongst your, amongst your parents see that amongst your own siblings. There's also anxiety that can be seen versus fearlessness. Again, something that we see, it's behavioral and it tells us about how kids will react in certain situations. Will they be anxious? or will they be fearless? Um, amongst any given family, of course, there may be differences in these kind of things. But, but it's interesting to think about how does genetic make a, genetics make a difference in that? One of the things I think is very interesting or, or just something that happened to me that I think is a clue to how behavior may be genetic is I used to live in St. George, Utah, which is kind of this desert town in Southern Utah, very small. I lived there when I was growing up in high school. And I had a friend who was a Christensen. And if you lived in, in Utah, you might rec recognize that there's Christensen department stores. And my friend happened to be the person that the Christensen's relied upon to determine what would be fashionable in their stores. Um, my friend was always considered one of the very best dressed individuals in high school. Uh, because he always picked the, the trendy clothes that would be sold in Christensen's department stores. So one week, uh, my friend disappeared from, from school. And when he returned, he said that he had been in Los Angeles, California, picking out clothes <laughs> that would soon be trendy in St. George, Utah. He then told me about something that happened while he was in California. In California, he went to church. And a person was speaking at church. He wasn't paying much attention when, when the person began to speak, he actually said, huh, that person sounds like Daryl Scott. In other words, the way he speaks is just the way that my friend Daryl Scott speaks. He then looks at the, at the speaker, and although the speaker doesn't look particularly like Daryl Scott, his mannerisms are identical, at least he's convinced that they are. He then asks his parents if, there's a, if they have a program. He looks at the program, and indeed, the person who is scheduled to speak, the person at the pulpit at this time, is Craig Scott. 
He then goes up to Craig Scott after the meeting and says, by chance, do you have a relative named Daryl who lives in St. George, Utah? And Craig Scott says, yes, that's my younger brother. Even though we are 16 years apart, so he's 16 years my, my senior, he moved out of, out of the home when I was just a toddler. We still have mannerisms that are so unique that they can be picked out by my friend, even when he's visiting in a completely different city. Um, it's a little bit scary, but indeed, probably this, this is a, a sense that yes, behavior can be genetic. It may also be partly because we were raised in the same family, but again, 16 years difference is quite a big difference between the environment that I was raised in and the environment that he was raised in. So let's go back to, to some other parts of humans. Let's go back to, for example, anxiety. Um, remember how I told you that there were special tests for mice that can, that can measure certain things? Well, there's special tests for humans that can measure things too. Like for anxiety, there's this anxiety sensitivity index. What is this is, is basically a questionnaire that asks about physical concerns. Like, are you, are you concerned and scared when you have a rapid heartbeat? Or psychological concerns, you're scared that you may be unable to keep on task. Or social concerns, it's, is it important for you to not look that, like you're nervous in a situation? This index has been tested and has been proven to show differences in anxiety. And so they, then you can use a standard test to say, well, does a person from one place or one family, do they have differences in anxiety? The way we typically do anxiety tests to tell whether they're genetic is we do twin studies. So we compare how close are the scores of identical twins, for example, to twins who are not identical, but are raised in the same family. That actually makes a way for us to gauge heritability. We can also do twins that share all their DNA versus siblings that share 50% of their DNA. Or again, cousins, and we can move that out. And so you have different levels of how closely related are individuals genetically. As it turns out, anxiety is thought to be heritable or about 45% heritable. In other words, of all the different variants we see in anxiety in, within the population, 45% of that is determined by genes. There's also tests for aggression and irritability. Um, this is called the burst dirk hostility inventory. It's kind of interesting. This one's a true false question test. Things like, my friends say that I argue a lot. And you say yes or no, or true or false. Sometimes I get so mad I break things, true or false. Other people's, people always get the breaks. I flare up, but get over it quickly. When people are nice to me, I wonder what they want. <laughs> it's kind of a fun little inventory, right? I mean, you go through and, and you may say, well, no, I don't do that. Other people say, well, yeah, that totally describes me. Well, this is an inventory for aggression and irritability. Again, it can be applied to family members and say, how much is aggression and irritability genetic? And so in one particular study, they looked at Vietnam era, era twin, twin registries, and they used this particular test. And what they found was they found concordance or, or genetic, genetic underpinnings for things like direct assault. So some of the questions ask about things that would be considered direct assault. 45% of that was genetic. Indirect assault, 40%. Those that showed irritability, 37% genetic. And verbal assault was 28% genetic. Again, it says that even sometimes our behaviors that are not ideal are part also of genetics or have some genetic underpinning. So let's talk a little bit about genetic disorders. Um, we know lots of different genetic disorders and, and I see lots of kids that have genetic disorders in my clinic. Um, I know that how some of them will behave because I know that the, the syndromes that they have, but you probably also have met some individuals have these same things. So most of us know someone who has Down syndrome. They have these distinctive facial features. They can have congenital heart defects, short stature, developmental delay and intellectual disability, which can vary quite a lot from one person to another. 
But there are also behavioral things like anxiety, repetitive and obsessive compulsive behaviors, oppositional behavior, impulsivity, and inattentiveness. Now, this doesn't mean that every individual at every given time shows all these things. But if you, again, use the same type of tests, those same kinds of things come up where this is more common in individuals with Down syndrome than in the general population. Williams syndrome is another one that's very fun. The first time I ever met someone with Williams syndrome, um, I did not know, I was not a geneticist, and I did not know what they had. Um, they came up to me. I had met, never met them before. They were super engaging. This is Williams syndrome. They have very distinct facial features. They include like a wide mouth, wide space teeth, heart defects, delayed language development, which is delayed. But then over time, they become very verbal. But they also have intellectual disability and difficulty with executive function, which is kind of making normal decisions like how do you balance your checkbook, stock, that kind of stuff. I don't know, does anybody balance checkbooks anymore? Anyway, their, their credit card statement. But they have this very cocktail party personality where they're very, they want very much to engage you. They are overly friendly. But if you engage them in a deep conversation, you realize that they actually do not have a lot that's behind that. So they can't carry on very detailed conversations about topics because they have this difficulty with, with their executive and intellectual function. Um, but again, extremely, extremely friendly. Um, and this is something that would be consistent across all individuals who have Williams syndrome. DeGeorge syndrome. This is, again, relatively common, um, it's, but it may not be one that, that a, a syndrome that you are completely familiar with. Um, DeGeorge syndrome we often find in individuals who have heart defects, cleft lip and palate, immunodeficiency, but they also have some, some variable developmental delay and intellectual disability. At the same time, individuals could be graduating from college with this and have very few symptoms. But when you look at it, at all these individuals in general, they have higher risk for attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, anxiety, mood disorders, autism spectrum disorder, and even schizophrenia and psychotic disorders as time goes on. This is caused by a little deletion on chromosome 22. Um, again, each individual may be different, but as a whole, these type of behaviors are more common. So, there's a lot of different syndromes that, that I can see in genetics clinic, all kinds of different ones. As it turns out, every single one of these syndromes can have also some associated behavioral issues, and they may be unique to these particular syndromes. And when I meet children with these syndromes, I think about those behaviors and then modify my behavior accordingly. So behavior, is it genetic? Well, again, the, probably the answer is partially. Um, there's definitely genes and environment, but also personal choices. In other words, you're still responsible for the choices you make, right? But yes, your propensity to do certain things in certain situations may be different because of your genes. It may also be different based on the way you were raised and on the choices you make about how you're going to behave. But all of these things work together to make up our behavior. So now's the time for some take home messages and applications. So let's first start with you. Uh, what do we want you to remember? Well, if you were thinking about the height part uh, and you're not happy with your height, I suggest just getting over it because most of us aren't growing anymore and so we really can't change that at all. If you're worried about your weight, my only advice is to eat healthy and exercise. If you're worried about behavior, don't forget that it isn't all genetic. And so my advice to you is to choose to be nice. When you think about others, um, one of the things to remember is that people's behavior um, may be different because of their genes. And since people don't get to choose their genes, um, perhaps we should give people the benefit of the doubt. Um, so if we say, what, is in, what was my summary? I would summarize that genetics can influence behavior. It may not make a difference in everything that you do. It may not determine all the choices you make or how you react to every situation. But again, when you think about it in general, yes, there's a significant part of behavior that is indeed genetic. Thanks for letting me be part of your night tonight and for joining us. And um, I think I'll be taking some, some questions later on. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Scott.
Um, and now we'll hand it over to Ms. Cecilia Poole. And so again, her daughter has Smith-McGinnis syndrome and Smith-McGinnis syndrome is one of the conditions where there is a behavioral component. And so we invited her to speak to kind of share her experience. All right, you can go ahead and share your screen now. Uh, are y'all seeing my screen? Not, not quite I, yet. Not yet. Okay, hold on a second here. I've got to get back. <laughs> I just hit something and now I'm uh, not where I need to be, right, Sarah? I've got my assistant with me though, <laughs> my technology expert. I'm sharing my screen now. I like see a screen. Yeah, I don't see it. I think you can't see a screen part yet. Because I got out of it. <laughs> Participants can now see your screen. All right. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Perfect. Are y'all seeing you. this? Yep. We can see it. All right. Great. Thanks so much. Sorry about that. I hit something and I got myself okay. jumped out. Well, I am joined here with my associate, Sarah Poole who has Smith McGinnis syndrome and I'm Cecilia Poole. I'm her mother and her guardian. And we both thoroughly enjoyed Dr. Scott's uh, presentation and I learned a lot. Did you learn a lot, Sarah? Uh, we're very grateful to be here so we can share, you know, at least our story and our experience. And uh, hopefully we can, you know, teach something as well. Uh, Sarah does have Smith McGinnis syndrome and her uh, version of it uh, is, what's commonly known as the most, well, it's the most common type. 80% uh, and the statistics may have changed, but the last time I heard this statistic, 80% um, of individuals who have been diagnosed with Smith-McGinnis syndrome have uh, what's called a microdeletion on the 17th chromosome. And Sarah has that common form of it. There is another manifestation, which is uh, a mutation um, on the genes, like REI1 gene. And through the, our outreach uh, to some of the other families, we have met some of those individuals um, who have those um, characteristics of Smith McGinnis syndrome, but there are some slight differences. Behaviorally, I do not know what those differences are, but I'm just going to talk about our experience. And this is my husband, Gordy Poole. <laughs> Hi, guys. And uh, talk talk about some of the, uh, the things that we've run into as far as the behavior with Smith-McGinnis syndrome in three main areas. So I thought it would be best to kind of organize it this way. And Gordy was so helpful because he jotted down some ideas and then I kind of grouped it into routine changes, hygiene and health and food. So these are just some pictures and that's Sarah with me and her sister, Megan, and her dad, Gordy, and her Mima. And hopefully we can teach you guys something. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, uh, so Sarah, um, these are just a few pictures just from yeah. over the years. Um, Sarah, and that's my sister, Barb Holdinger, yeah. uh, and that's Sarah with a cousin. Sarah is uh, biologically our great niece, but I do yeah. know that at birth, mm -hmm. she was, she weighed four pounds and 15 ounces. So she was pretty small and she had a good APCAR score. So there was no concern when she was born. That's not always mm -hmm. the case with Smith McGinnis syndrome. In fact, a lot of times the children who are born with it have a significant uh, physical mm -hmm. health problems where they're, they have to be hospitalized and have surgery right out of the chute. But Sarah did not have that she actually went home um but things started to become apparent so for us and this isn't behavioral but eventually things start to happen but for us one of the first things we noticed was that she was very weak and she couldn't eat uh, she couldn't suck very well and that is one of the common things with her syndrome so it would take early on, it would take 45 minutes just to get two ounces of fluid down her. So it was just a nightmare, but, and we got, we got her when she was seven weeks old and she was still uh, the size of a premature yeah. baby. So let's talk about some of the behavioral things. Mm -hmm. So one of the big mm -hmm. things that is hard for them to handle are changes in routine, um, obsessive compulsive behavior, and all of these things can trigger, can trigger uh, meltdowns. 
and y'all weren't here when we were getting ready to start this evening. And I know the people on uh, who are running this and also Dr. Scott maybe saw Sarah very agitated, walking back and forth. She didn't like that when I would normally be over having dinner with her. I'm over here doing this. Even though we had kind of told her about it, she didn't fully understand it because this was a new experience for her. So parents who have children with smith McGinnis syndrome, we are very well trained. We usually know what our kiddos are expecting or we're really trying to figure out what our kiddos are expecting. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, when we drive somewhere, Sarah and I, she likes to, she likes to be, um, what do you call it? Cockpit? No. Yeah, because yeah, <laughs> yeah, you can't hear when you're doing that. Okay. Um, Mommy's she, trying to explain. She likes to unbuckle me. And if I don't, if I unbuckle myself when we're getting out of the car, if I do it, she gets really upset. And sometimes she will ask me even, because she can't remember if she did unbuckled me. Did I unbuckle you? So that's really, really important to her. Uh, another thing that really upsets her is um, when, Surprise. well, surprises. But for example, we were out of town and we were attending a church service. And at our church, we typically will sit on the right side. But this was on Easter Sunday. We were out of town and we decided because of the way everything was set up, that we should go move over to the middle. Well, that was a very big mistake because Sarah got extremely upset. Fortunately, we were there early, so she had some time to get her composure. Decompress. Yeah, decompress. And that was good like tonight, right? When you're first setting up for this talk tonight, you were pretty upset and worked up and doing some stemming type stuff, rubbing her nose. But now she's kind of had some time to watch Dr. Scott, who had a very calm delivery. And now she's just sort of interested. She enjoyed the pictures, by the way. Yeah. Did you enjoy yeah. the pictures? May I say something? Yeah, go ahead. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Sarah's dad, Gordy. Um, when Cece was explaining about how small they are when they're babies, now it's just the opposite. There's... Well, we're going to talk oh, about food. We're yeah. Talk about food. Yeah, okay. we're going to talk about but, food. But Yay, if a food. little's good, a lot's got to be a lot. <laughs> but anyway, I'll let Cece yeah. take it. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. So there's a lot of and, uh, obsessive compulsive behaviors, yeah. and we've been noticing that that's getting a lot worse with Sarah. Yeah. So, and we're not really sure. So we may be having a conversation with uh, our new doctor here in Bryan and asking for a referral because she's stressed and it's very stressful for her. So that's super duper important. Um, we don't have to deal with this much, but um, there are aggressive behaviors and self-injury. Sarah hasn't done that, thankfully, too much. Um, when she was little, about three years mm -hmm. old, she was frustrated because she was having trouble communicating because their speech can be severely delayed. And I remember like it was yesterday that she whacked her head on the tile in the kitchen. And of course that really hurt. And she looked up at me and just startled because it hurt and started to cry. And I said, well, don't do that. <laughs> but as much as I laugh, it's very serious because some kids have uh, blinded themselves, whacking their heads. Uh, another thing that they'll do is they, they can bite on their hands. And Sarah historically has never really done much of that until recently. And I don't know if it's the stress of us moving here, but I started to notice that she had some cuts on her fingers. And so <laughs> she's trying to show you. And I finally caught her. I noticed that she was chewing on her finger. So I'm not thrilled that she's doing that. Plus it also, you know, leaves you open for opportunities to get infections. So these are the things that behaviorally we have noticed um, mm. with Sarah. Mm. Uh, the other thing is, I will tell you, like talking about changes and routine. So Sarah's big sister got married in December yeah. and Sarah was a bridesmaid and yeah. it was very stressful for her, but she managed to come through it very, very beautifully. Mm. But we did not know until the last second if she was going to be able to, you know, walk down the aisle and even when we were in line getting ready to walk out and I was holding my father-in-law because he's old, elderly and I wanted to study him. 
she said, mommy, I don't know if I can do this. And I said, sir, you got this, you can do this. And then she put her attempt, her mind to it and she got it. But most of the pictures, she's not really smiling. She's pretty stressed. She's really focusing and it's, it's hard, hard, hard for her. And I think the main reason she was able to accomplish this is because she just loved her big sissy so much, right? And you wanted her wedding to be nice. And it was, it was very nice. She did a great job. So that is a, a big part of our yeah. world when, uh, when we're dealing with Sarah. Health and hygiene are a constant, constant thing that we're having to deal with. And I, I know this isn't so much behavioral, but sometimes I wonder if um, you know some of these things lead to behavioral complications. For example, Sarah, um, you know, I want glasses on <laughs> yeah, well, for, for example, uh, Sarah's one of her ears got plugged up really bad and we didn't know that and she does wear hearing aids, but even so we were noticing a lot of this, you know, just not very good behaviors and frustration and it seemed worse than usual. And then we happened to be taking her in for her, you know, every six month, uh, ENT appointment and he goes her right ear is completely plugged up um, so he you know he took care of it but that didn't help her behaviors because when mm. she can't tell what's going on around her just like any of us but especially I think for our kiddos that just was setting her off that much more uh, another thing that she has is um, one of her legs is was uh it's it's twisted a little bit her left leg and mm -hmm. they say it's congenital i know that it doesn't help her with getting around and i've read that kids with smith mcginnis syndrome um that they have an uneven gait and i wonder is this something common to all the kids i haven't read any research recently but i do wonder about it she also gets bladder infections frequently um, she has she's just finished some medication for one right now it's a constant thing trying to keep clean and uh, it's a worry for us all the time because she wants to be independent but because of uh, their weird sleep patterns a lot of times she's up in the middle of the night and then she's trying to clean herself and I don't realize what she's doing and then it's not adequate and then, you know, by the time I'm in the morning, the damage has been done. So that's another thing. And then uh, pain, pain, uh, a lot of times when they're ill, they can get super sick before they have real pain that they're noticing. And then all of a sudden, you know, all bad behaviors are happening. And it's because all of a sudden the pain has just become like, something that they're recognizing so that's partly why i'm bringing yeah, that so I have type two diabetes. <laughs> oh and just so you know she has type 2 diabetes that's right i just put all this and stuff a in this. infection well hopefully it's over you just finished your medicine yeah Maybe. as you can see sarah has a great sense of humor when she's calm she's very funny and very very enjoyable to be around um next so, up is food yeah so the, and this might come under obsessive compulsive and I know a lot of people uh you know struggle with you know not overeating but I think some of this goes hand in hand with just recognizing when you're full and actually Sarah was in a research study um over in the I'm trying to think if it was connected through Baylor College of Medicine, but we found out about it through Baylor and uh, she was taking a, a medicine via injection, daily injection called set melanotide. And they have found that kids with SMS, they don't have the signaling that tells your brain, hey, uh, you're full. I mean, you need to stop eating. And one time I remember this distinctly that Sarah had brought home, somebody gave her these gigantic cookies and bad mommy, I forgot to hide these bad cookies, these gigantic cookies from her. And she found them. And I got up in the morning and I saw little crumbs. And uh, 
come to find she had eaten what all of was them, that? all sick. They were huge. I would say probably three or four hundred calories a what piece. Was that? Oh, it was quite a few years ago, but you did it. And uh, like and a bag, a, a bag of chocolate chips, a large bag. I had a double batch at Christmas that I was going to make, you know, cookies. And she found it and she ate the entire bag. Um, I don't know what the ounces are, but you know, the double batch ones. So and here's that's a problem. Room. One thing I forgot to put in the presentation, and I'm just going to check the time real quick. Okay, I'm wrapping it up here. Um, Sarah, um, uh, her sleep, her sleep pattern. So there is a, a reverse circadian rhythm for melatonin production in children, people who have Smith McGinnis syndrome, and she definitely has that. There is no doubt about it. When we were dealing with her as a baby, I immediately noticed that she was awake all night and then went to sleep all day. And my mom just kept telling me, you need to just let her cry it out, let her cry it out. I said, mom, you don't understand. She's like Dracula, like she is up the entire night. And uh, we were working with Dr. Lorraine Pataki at the time. She was guiding us through various things with Sarah's syndrome. And uh, Sarah was 23 months old. And my husband and I both working full time. And I just said, we're, we're just, we're going to die. I actually ended up in the hospital. I got sick and I couldn't get over it because I was only sleeping maybe three or four hours a night um, because I had to, you know, take care of her and watch her, especially when she started to get a little bit mobile. Um, but um, later when they're older, if they're not getting enough sleep, you can imagine what that does to somebody's behavior. And uh I called Dr. Pataki and said, we have to get on this melatonin. And she said, all right, 23 months. She wanted me to wait till she was two years old, but she said, all right, go ahead. And we immediately noticed an improvement in her sleep pattern. And I feel like the fact that she's able to sleep somewhat adequately um, has helped her behavior. And I had an opportunity to meet Dr. McGinnis of Smith McGinnis syndrome. And I asked her, what do you think contributes the most to the behavioral issues with these kids? And she said, I think it's the inadequate and poor quality of mm -hmm. their sleep. And I think about myself when I don't get enough sleep, how I feel, but you can imagine if you're every day of your life, not getting the right sleep, that's not going to be good for your behavior. So really, that's all I had to share. Well, thank you so much. This has been incredible, I'm, both of you um, speaking on this topic, and I definitely learned a lot. Um, there is a survey in the chat, so if people could please complete that just to um, give us some ideas, topics, things that you'd like to hear for the fall. Um, and once again, thank you, Dr. Scott and Cecilia for and Sarah um, for speaking to us tonight, and have a good night, everybody. Take care. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks.